The Origin of Tyranny by P. and Percy Neville Yore. Chapter Romans 7, Corinth Strabo Roman 8, 382, in the passage of Thucydides in which he associates the origin of tyranny with the acquisition of wealth. One other development is mentioned as characteristic of the age. Greece began to fit out fleets and took more to the sea. If the views expressed in the last chapter are not entirely mistaken, then in Greece proper the earliest phases of all these developments. In politics, in industry, and in commerce by land and sea are all to be associated with Phaedon of Argos. But on the same showing Phaedon was a man born rather before his time and not quite in the right place. The town marked out by its situation to develop the new tendencies to the fullest was Corinth, and it is in fact from Corinth that Thucydides draws his illustration. Mentioning in this connection the shipbuilding of the Corinthian Amenocles about 704 before Christ and the naval battle between Corinth and Corsaira of about 664 before Christ he says nothing about Corinthian tyrants. But the description of the situation at Corinth is simply a paraphrase of that of the general situation that led to tyrannies. Corinth is chosen to exemplify the normal course of things in a 7th century Greek town, and it may be taken as certain that Thucydides regards the tyranny at Corinth as the outcome of the mercantile and maritime developments described in the passage just quoted. Only, what was the personal relationship of the tyrants to the new developments? Before attempting to answer this question, one important addition may be made to Thucydides' picture of the state of things in the city when the tyranny arose. Corinth was not engaged only in commerce and shipping. She was also a great industrial center. In the chapter on Argo's reasons have been given for thinking that the tyrant Phaedon flourished just at the time when pottery of the style called for want of a better name Proto-Corinthian was enjoying a great vogue in a great part of the Greek world. That much at least of this ware was made in Phaedon's dominions, and that Phaedon took political measures to crush or cripple rival centers. Towards the middle of the 7th century Proto-Corinthian ware was eclipsed by a new style, which with good reason has been named Corinthian. This new style became so popular that the invention of the potter's wheel was ascribed to a Corinthian. Corinthian vases of this period show one of the most decorative and distinctive styles of pottery that has ever been invented. The style of decoration somewhat recalls oriental carpets, and it was long ago plausibly suggested that oriental carpets or tapestries furnished the models for the Corinthian vase painters. 
two jugs in this style, one from Corinth itself, the other from Cornito Tarquinii are shown in figs. 22 and 34 votive tablets of the 6th century before Christ have been found at Corinth that depict various stages of the manufacture. Two are here reproduced figs. 23-24. This very distinctive pottery made its way over a great part of the Greek world. It has been found in large quantities all over Sicily, South Italy and Etruria, in many parts of Greece proper, and in many places further east. Cypselus established himself as tyrant in 657 before Christ at the height of these great developments of Corinthian industry. Trade and Shipping It has been noticed by Busolt that 657 is also the year of the conquest of Sardis by the Cimmerians. The disturbances in Asia Minor may have enhanced the importance of the Western trade, in which Corinth was particularly concerned. They may incidentally have removed, at least for the time being, a very powerful commercial rival, since Corinth and Lydia appear to have been engaged in much the same industries, namely weaving, dyeing, metallurgy, horse rearing, and the making of ointments, in addition to pottery. A fact that can hardly have been accidental, and points to Corinth having been influenced by Lydia. Both before and after the Cimmerian invasion, Lydia and Corinth appear to have been on excellent terms, but this would not prevent Corinthian merchants from growing more prosperous through Lydia's troubles. Whether the rise of Cypselus had any connection with the beginnings of Corinthian coinage is a matter of dispute. Busold dates the earliest issues some half-century later than the establishment of the tyranny, Head, on the other hand, makes the coinage, and the tyranny begin approximately together, and he is supported by Percy Gardner, who dates the earliest coins of Corinth in the early part of the 7th century, but after 665 before Christ if. Then, as seems probable, the English numismatists are nearer the truth than the German, the first issues of Colts. As the coins were colloquially called from the winged horse that they bore, may have played their part in helping Cypselus to the tyranny. The traces of Lydian influence support this view, but on the other hand Corinth, whose trade was so preponderatingly with the West, may, like its colony Corsaira, have felt the need of a coinage only comparatively late where the main facts are so obscure and particulars are completely wanting it is idle to carry speculation further. For evidence, as to Cypselus' personal relationship to the commercial developments of his age, we must look elsewhere. Some modern writers have indeed despaired of recovering any picture of the personal history of a ruler who is variously described by our best authorities as having ruled mildly and with bloodthirsty severity. This attitude is quite unnecessary. Both statements are in themselves quite credible as contemporary accounts of the same regime from different points of view. Still, by themselves they do not take us very far. Fortunately, we are better informed in other directions. Of the Corinthian colonies in western Greece, that lined the trade route to Sicily and Italy and the furthest west. Lucas, Ambracia, and Anactorian were founded by Cypselus. Lucas was converted by him from a peninsula into an island for the greater convenience of navigation. 
Cypselus is said to have taxed his subjects heavily. This statement is taken from the Pseudo-Aristotelian Oconomica, a work of no great authority for our early period. The tax is associated by Suidas with the dedication of a colossus of beaten gold which Didymus says was made by Periander not Cypselus with the object of checking the Corinthians in their luxury and arrogance. Theophrastus, so Suidas also states, called the statue, the Colossus not of Cypselus but of the sons of Cypselus. The statement of the Oconomica must therefore be taken with reserve. But the story of Cypselus' heavy taxation states also that the tyrant made his subjects work and prosper and able to pay the taxes. Whatever the truth about the Colossus, the fact remains that the fame of Cypselus was largely eclipsed by that of his son and successor Periander, who was actually claimed by some writers as one of the seven sages of early Greece. This is unfortunate when we are searching for origins, since Periander is said to have changed the character of the sovereignty. Even if the authorities who made this statement are not particularly good, the son born in the purple can never succeed exactly to the position of the father who founded the house. Luckily, however, we are told the nature of Periander's change. He regarded himself as a soldier and sought to make Corinth a great military power whereas Cypselus had been a man of peace with a peaceful policy. So far, therefore, as Periander's policy was not directly or indirectly military, there is no need to assume a break with that of his father. He maintained and enlarged the colonial empire of the city. As regards Corinthian trade under Periander, we are told that his public revenues were all derived from its taxation, but everything shows that he did not follow the backyards and tax it ruthlessly. Rather, he seems to have aimed at increasing his revenues by fostering commerce. Corinthian shipping, with which the trade of the city was inseparably bound up, certainly owed much to him. He built triremes and plied both seas. This last statement seems intended to contrast Periander with his father, whose activities had been mainly in the West. Periander, on the other hand, is found acting in close concert with Thrasybulus, the tyrant of Miltus. He has been suspected of slave dealing with Lydia and acted as arbitrator between that state and Miltus. He had a nephew who bore the name of a king of Egypt. In order the better to ply both seas, he is said to have wanted to cut a canal through the Corinthian Isthmus. Here, too, he was following in the footsteps of his father who had vilificated Lucas. It is interesting, therefore, to notice the emphasis laid on Periander's wealth and to recall the social legislation attributed to him by Nicolaus Damasinus, according to whom the tyrant forbade the citizens to acquire slaves and live in idleness and continually found them some employment. Heraclides and Diogenes Laertius quoting Ephorus and Aristotle state, that he did not allow anybody and everybody to live in the city. Their statement is capable of many interpretations. It may mean that Periander sought to control labor in the city or to prevent the rural population from quitting the land for the superior attractions of life in the great industrial center. In short, from first to last, the tyranny at Corinth is seen taking an active part in guiding the industrial. 
commercial and maritime activities of the city. This, however, is what might be expected from any able government at the period. And nobody has ever questioned the Sipsilids' ability. The previous government, that of the aristocracy of the Bacchiads, had exploited the market with impunity. And very possibly this short-sighted policy had hastened and helped their fall. But how precisely were they overthrown? What was the career of Sipsellus previous to his obtaining the tyranny? According to Nicolaus de Amasinus, who based himself largely on the 4th century Ephorus, Labda, the mother of Sipsellus, belonged to the Bacchiad aristocracy, but owing to a personal deformity she had married beneath her. Her husband, Eshin, is variously said to have been descended from the pre-Hellenic Lapithy of Thessaly and from a non-Dorian stock of Gonissa above Sicyon. In any case, as observed by Howe and Wells, Eshin belonged to the pre-Dorian Aeolic population of Corinth. The Bacchian aristocracy was extremely exclusive. Its members married only among themselves. Consequently, the official oracles prophesied evil from this union, and when a son was born of it, the government sent agents to destroy the child. But the infant melted the hearts of its would-be murderers, and instead of killing it they went back and reported that they had done so. The infant was sent away by its parents to Olympia, and was brought up first there and then at Cleone. Encouraged by a Delphic oracle, Sipsellus returned to Corinth, became very popular, was elected Polemarch, and made himself still more popular by refusing to imprison citizens and remitting in all cases his part of their fines. Finally, he headed a rising against the unpopular Bacchiads, killed Patroclades, who was king at the time, and was made king in his stead. He ruled mildly, neither maintaining a bodyguard nor losing the people's favor. Such is the account given by Nicholas of Damascus. For the greater part of it, we have no earlier authority. But once more we must be on our guard against too hasty skepticism. Ephorus, who is generally admitted to have been the source of this account, was not further removed from Sipsellus than this age is from Cromwell. Sipsellus was the foremost man of his age in all Greece. We need to be very skeptical of such skepticism as that of Busult, who argues that Sipsellus cannot have been Polmark before he became tyrant, because if his parentage was not known he would not have been eligible, while if it was he would not have been elected. As pointed out many years ago by Willish, such arguments are dangerous when applied to times of which so little is known. The aristocracy which fell in 657 before Christ may have begun to totter some time earlier. Given the requisite gaps in our knowledge, Busolt's line of argument might be equally well used to discredit the received tradition about the Victorian age in England on the ground that it contains the highly improbable statement that the leader of the aristocratic party was an Italian Jew. Ephorus seems to have been used by Aristotle. It would be rash indeed to follow Busolt and agree that such a source may yet be valueless. Aristotle is not to be treated in this way. The whole character of his work forces us to start with the assumption that he had some idea of the difference between myth and historical tradition. We always know the reasons why modern scholars are sometimes inclined to discredit him. 
We do not always know the reasons that led Aristotle to accept as facts what he so accepts. What we do know is that the material on which he based his statements was far more ample than that which is now at our disposal. Even for a period so comparatively remote from him as the 7th century before Christ, Aristotle must have been able to collect much evidence of one sort or another to confirm him alike in his doubts and his beliefs. For 8th century Corinth, Aristotle and his contemporaries probably had the poems of the Corinthian Eumelos, who flourished about 750 before Christ and wrote, among other works, an epic called A Prose History of Corinth was also ascribed to him. The ascription is doubted by Pausanias, not without reason, but it may still have been a document of some value and antiquity. The same is true of the didactic poem in 2,000 lines ascribed by Diogenes Laertius to Periander himself. We are learning to take our ancient records more on their face value than was done by our grandfathers in the 19th century. The classical historians, using the word in its widest sense, are still suffering from the reaction against the doctrine of verbal inspiration. The story of the infant Cypselus is put by Plutarch into the mouth of a certain Chersias the poet, who is represented as having during a banquet given by Periander mentioned others, whose lives had been saved when despaired of, and in particular Cypselus the father of Periander. One of the skeptics has recently accepted this Chersias as historical and imagined Plutarch, as here making use of a poem of his which he proceeds to explain as a fiction invented to give an appearance of legitimacy to the Sipsilids. The explanation is quite gratuitous. It is true that Diogenes Laertius speaks of Periander as of the race of the Heraclids. But Chersias in Plutarch does not mention even the parents of Cypselus, much less his remote ancestors. And there is no evidence that he had them in mind. The poem itself is a doubtful item. The only inference to be drawn from Plutarch is that to his readers the poem assuming its existence probably seemed in keeping with the scene. It is, however, well to be reminded that even Plutarch had much more literary material to draw from for this early period than have the moderns. On the whole, therefore, the safest attitude towards the narrative of Nicolaus will be one of benevolent agnosticism. No doubt he had a tendency to rationalize half or wholly mythical stories. It is not improbable that he did this to some extent in his account of the infant Cypselus, with which we can compare the version of Herodotus. But when he makes a simple statement of commonplace fact, as, for instance, that Cypselus was polemarked before he became tyrant, the most prudent and the most critical course is to accept it as probably true. The reason why the record of this fact was preserved is not far to seek. The 4th century historians seized on the name as evidence that Cypselus was in fact as well as in name a ruler of the same order as Dionysius, who started his career as a military demagogue. But the context shows that the pole mark was not in this case a military officer. And we know by implication that Cypselus was not a warlike person, for the record of how Periander changed the character of the government goes on to say that he became warlike. And, as remarked long ago by Shubring, if the tenure of the Polmarchy is historical, but rather like the murder of the Bacchiad Patroclades, a sign and token, 
that he was already in a position to seize it. Nicolaus therefore brings us little nearer to understanding the basis of the future tyrant's power. Our only hope of doing this lies in Herodotus, who tells the story of the infant Cipsellus with certain details omitted by Nicolaus but which probably contain the essence of the story. According to Herodotus, Cipsellus was the child from the Cipsell, in which as an infant his mother had concealed him from his would-be murderers. If we are to believe Plutarch, the story of the Cipsell could still in his days be traced back to the days of Periander. It is easy to point out that we are here up against a widespread story of which different versions have been attached to such different names as Sargon of Akkad C. 3,800 before Christ, Moses, Romulus, and Cyrus. But even if we accept a common origin for all these stories, we are not very much further on. We should still have to determine why and how Cipsellus found a place in the series. But it must not be too hastily assumed that the Cipsell of Cipsellus has anything at all to do with the Ark that Pharaoh's daughter found on the banks of the Nile or the Alois discovered by the shepherd Faustulus on the banks of the Tiber. In both these cases, the vessel could float and was discovered by a riverside. Cipsellus was not discovered. That is the whole point of the story. He was not exposed in a river or sea like Romulus or Perseus. And it is more than doubtful whether a Cipsell has any connection whatever within a Lewis or Ark. It is true that they are more or less identified by our ancient authorities. Pausanias, who wrote his guide to Greece in the second century A, D. Professed to have seen at Olympia the very Cipsell in which Cipsellus had been hidden, and from which he was said to have got his name. It was a coffer of wood and ivory elaborately carved. The description leaves no doubt that it was of archaic Corinthian workmanship of the time of the tyrants or not much later. But it is extremely doubtful whether this carved box was a Cipsell or had any original connection with the Cipsell story. Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch all refer to the dedications of the house of Cipsellus without alluding to this object. Herodotus says nothing about the Cipsell having been dedicated. For Strabo, the chief dedication of Cipsellus was a golden hammered Zeus. Dio Chrysostom, about 100 AD, refers to what Pausanias calls the Cipsell of Cipsellus, but describes it simply as the wooden box dedicated by Cipsellus. From Pausanias himself, it is plain that the object was not by any means what the Greeks of his time understood by a Cipsell. His statement that the ancient Corinthians called a coffer a Cipsell raises a suspicion that nobody else ever did. It is probably only an inference drawn by the traveler from the fact of this particular coffer being so called by the guides at Olympia. The Olympian Larnax does not at all correspond to the picture of a Cipsell suggested by the ancient notices on the subject which, quite apart from the light they may possibly throw on Cipsellus, deserve a more detailed examination than they have hitherto received. The meanings of the word given by the ancients are as follows.
one, a wine vessel, two, a vessel to receive wheat or barley, three, part of a furnace, four, a beehive, five, vessels for sweet condiments or receptacles for such vessels, six, the whole of the ear, seven, wax in the ears, this literary evidence may be supplemented from a numismatic source. Some 4th century before Christ coins of the Thracian Cypsella show a more or less cylindrical vessel with two small vertical handles. A similar vessel, resting on what is probably a grain of corn, is shown on other coins of the same century and from the same district. The vessel has very plausibly been identified as a sipsel. At first sight, the various uses of the word appear rather miscellaneous, especially if we include six and seven. But six and seven need not be brought in. They are late uses derived from four. Meaning five is probably to be eliminated on the same grounds. This leaves us with one to four, all of them vessels of large size, a feature implicit in the Cypselis legend and confirmed by the ancient lexicographers. For the material of Cypseli under meanings one to five, the only written evidence is found in I skull. Aristoph, Pax 631, which says that Cypsili were not only woven but also of pottery, Roman to a scoliast to Lucian. Lexiphanes, one which explains the Cypsel as of a narrow-mouthed unpitched vessel of pottery, be an earthenware vessel. See the name is also given to a sort of woven vessel, Roman three Hesychius who explains a sipsel as a wickerwork beehive. These statements quite suit the list of uses, as between the two materials mentioned the Aristophanes scoliast gives the impression that the commoner was wicker or basket work. But in the Lucian scoliast wickerwork is only an afterthought added by a later hand. The Lucian scoliast is probably more correct. Pottery is a natural material for every kind of sipsel. Sipsili 1 and 3 can never have been of basketwork, and for 5 it looks a most unlikely material. Though we know too little about ancient spice vessels to speak with certainty. For 2 it is suitable enough. But the Cypsili of the Thracian coins, which the emblem of the grain of corn shows to have been probably corn jars, point in the other direction. Their shape suits either terracotta or metal, but not wickerwork. The probable use practically excludes metal, for is according to Hesychius a plated beehive, I e. a hive of basketwork, and this statement is accepted by M. Pottier, no doubt it was true at the time when it was made. But is it so certain that the earliest Cipsel beehives were of basketwork? The first reference to beehives is in the Odyssey, which describes hives of stone in the shape of vases, and these Homeric beehives must have been either prototypes or glorifications of hives of earthenware, and it is tempting to classify these latter with the Cipsel form of hive, especially in the light of the Cipsel on the Thracian coins, which has much the shape of a mixing bowl except that the handles are of a type more frequent on the amphora. These coins are of the first half of the 4th century. Our literary authorities are all much later. Most of them mention earthenware beehives only to condemn them. 
Presumably they were out of fashion. Basketwork hives, on the other hand, are spoken of without condemnation. When therefore they define the Sipsel beehive as a basketwork beehive, they practically mean a round or vase-shaped hive like the little pail, where the bee distills his sweet flow of antiphilis. As distinguished from the rectangular form that was also much in use. This is assuming that Sipsili were never rectangular, but the assumption seems fairly safe. Neither plating nor pottery adapts itself to rectangular shapes. Wine vessels are not usually square. The sipsel of the coins is not rectangular. There remains the certain part of a furnace referred to by Hesychius. Whatever this may have been, it is most unlikely that it was rectangular for the simple reason that ancient Greek furnaces appear from extant pictures to have no rectangular parts that could possibly be so identified. Pictures of ancient Greek furnaces are numerous, and it is surprising that no attempt seems to have been made to discover a sipsel in any of them. For it is not unlikely that some of these pictures do in fact depict it, and in that case, they show us the earliest form of the object of which we have any precise record. In Saglio's Dictionnaire des Antiquites, S. V. Fur, Figs, 2964-2965, here Figs, 27-28, pictures are reproduced from two black figure vases that depict furnaces being used. In all probability for treating iron, on the top of either furnace is depicted what Delaunay describes as a sort de vase. Sans doubt de terre cuite. A similar vase is shown ibid. S. V. K. Lechera, Fig 937 here, Fig 29, on top of what the context shows to be the furnace of a bronze foundry. This latter picture is on an early red figure vase. In all three cases, the sort of vase is very large, as is shown by comparing it in size with the human figures in the picture. In short, both in size, shape, use, and probably material, it answers to the written descriptions of one variety of sipsel. It does not so well answer to is the vase represented on the coins of Sipsella, which is tall and cylindrical and shows two vertical handles. Fortunately, there is a connecting link between the two forms. In the Berlin Museum, there is an actual stove of terracotta, said to have been found in the sea off Iasso's coast of Asia Minor. It is about 50 m high and of a common enough type, though it is rare to find one so well preserved. What however gives the Iasso's example its importance is a vase 13 m high and 192 diameter, of the same dark brown micaceous clay as the stove itself, that was found along with it and fits so well on top of it, that it must unquestionably have formed part of the complete article. Here we have a vase of considerable size that in shape has resemblances to the vases on the coins of Sipsella, but in its bulging sides deviates from them in the direction of our conjectured Sipsili of the vase paintings. In position and in use as the receptacle for material to be heated, it corresponds with these latter. Though comparatively large, it must remain doubtful whether it is large enough to be a subcell. But in any case it helps to connect the vases of the subcella coins with the part of a furnace of the vase paintings. 
and to make it probable that the latter was made of pottery, and that both are rightly identified as Sipsili. The objects on the vase paintings differ from all our other hypothetical Sipsili in having no handles. Even the beehive Sipsel has been connected with craters and amphorae, both of which normally have two handles. But it is use as often as shape that determines the name of a vase, and from the point of view of use the Iasos vase is probably to be classed with a vase figured on a Greek funeral relief fig. 31. Here we have an object very similar in shape to our conjectured Sipsili of the vase paintings, resting on what Dumont called Archard. Its size may be judged by comparing it with a human head from the same relief. There is no a priori reason why the ancient Sipsel, like the modern glass or bottle or cup or mug, the evidence just collected suggests that such was in fact the case, and it becomes the more likely when we remember that we are dealing with a period of some centuries. The Sipsella coins date only from the 4th century. The portable stoves of the Iasos type are later still. The funeral relief with the vase and archaud is dated by Dumont in the 1st century A. D. On the other hand, the vases depicting the Sipsel that forms part of a furnace belong to the 5th or 6th century before Christ and thus bring us to within measurable distance of Sipsellus himself. A Sipsell of this description would be an admirable hiding place for a baby, provided it was technically speaking a good baby, not given to crying, eventually, as has been seen. The box version of the story won the day, but from the Greek point of view there would be nothing impossible in a version which hid the child in an earthen jar. Eurystheus sought safety from Heracles in a war jar. In the 7th and 6th centuries infants were usually buried in large terracotta vases not unlike those we are here considering. In the 5th century, Aristophanes represents a supposititious child as introduced into the house in an earthenware pot. In short, everything points to the Sipsel of Sipsellus having been a large vessel of pottery. May not Herodotus, after all, be right when he says that the tyrant got his name from the Sipsel, the story of the attempted murder, and the ten bad men may be older than Sipsellus. But if so, we have to explain how it came to be attached to the Corinthian tyrant. Is it not possible that it was given to him as being just as later the demagogue Hyperbolus, who had spent his early days in a lamp factory, was spoken of as the man from the lamps, or, in other words, to denote his connection with the Corinthian potteries, which at this period were supplying a great part of the civilized world. Hyperbolus does not offer the only analogy for this suggestion, or even the closest. In the chapter on Rome, when tracing the source of the power of the Tarquins, we shall have occasion to examine the story of the Corinthian potters Eucher and Eugramus, who lived just at this period, and whose names meaning skillful with the hand and skillful at painting are palpably derived from their occupation. Sipsellus may possibly have adopted, or inherited from the founder of the firm, a Sipsell as his badge or emblem. And this may have been the immediate origin of his name. These personal or family badges or arms were widely used in ancient Greece. 
among the many found on the Heraclean tables, a box occurs three times. A is not a sipsel, but it is a similar object and shows that a sipsel might have been similarly used. The emblems, as a rule, seem to be entirely arbitrary and unconnected with the bearer's name or occupation. But the word in the original non-diminutive form became the nickname of Apamia in Phrygia from the fact that so much packing was done in that great center of trade. If Sipselus was originally a potter, he may be compared with Agathocles, tyrant at the end of the 4th century of Syracuse, the great daughter city of Corinth. Agathocles is said to have been the son of a potter. According to Diodorus Siculus, the Delphic oracle prophesied over the infant Agathocles, as it had over Sipselus, that he would be the cause of great misfortunes to his country, and as a result of the prophecy it was resolved to do away with the child, who, however, was saved by its mother. Eventually the father was told that the child had been saved, and took it back, and being poor, he taught Agathocles the potter's trade while he was still a boy. This story is probably to be traced back to Timaeus, who is quoted by Polybius for the statement that Agathocles was a potter, and is the only source of Diodorus actively hostile to the tyrant, by whom he had been banished from Sicily, Plainly, in great part, at least the story of the young Agathocles is a piece of malicious fiction. What is its prototype? I cannot help suspecting that it is Sipselus himself. It is true that there is no Sipsel or Larnax in the story, and Bauer connects it with the legends of the youthful Cyrus and infant Romulus. But neither is there an animal to suckle the infant, which the experts state to be the essential feature of the Cyrus Romulus cycle. The oracle and the rescue by the mother are both salient incidents of the Sipselis story. In the Cyrus story, we have dreams and their interpretation by magins, not nearly so close an analogy. The dreams, too, indicate only the greatness of the child that is to be born. The Sipselis story indicates, like that of Agathocles, the harm the child will do. Agathocles grew up in the days when the great name in Sicily was that of the Corinthian Timoleon. The thoughts of Sicily were all turned towards Corinth, and we find this rapprochement reflected in the Syracusan coins of the period, which show the Corinthian types of the helmeted goddess Head and Pegasus. What more natural, therefore, especially for the banished Timaeus, than to compare Agathocles with Sipselus? It is not impossible that from this seditious analogy there grew up the story that Agathocles was the son of a potter. The alternative is to accept Agathocles' early connection with the wheel, the clay, and the smoke of the pottery as a historical fact, but this is less likely. Polybius himself warns us against accepting Timaeus on Agathocles as truthful history, and seems himself to suspect his own quotation about the tyrant having been a potter in his early days. The elder brother of Agathocles was a prominent statesman and soldier in Syracuse early in his career. Before the younger brother had risen to the tyranny, Agathocles himself appears early in his career to have reached high rank in the army and to have lived in intimate relations with some of the Syracusan nobility. The tyrant's father was banished from Regium in the days when that city was under Dionysius of Syracuse. 
from which fact Bullock reasonably infers that he was a distinguished personality. Bullock supposes that Agathocles inherited a big pottery business. If this view is right, then the pottery does not seem to have greatly helped the future tyrant in his public career, which from first to last was essentially military. Still, though the capitalist tyrant was already a thing of the past in Greece proper, Sicily was in some ways younger than the mother country, and it is not impossible that Agathocles possessed a pottery and that it played a part, though not the leading one, in helping him on to the throne. Agathocles was the contemporary of the Roman Apius, whose suspected attempt at a financial despotism is discussed in the chapter on Rome. Before his accession he is described as having become very rich, but his riches are attributed to his marriage. The evidence about Agathocles' early career is not decisive. But, on any interpretation, it lends plausibility to the view that Sipselis started life as a potter. In the whole of this long discussion as to how Sipselis acquired his name, it has been assumed that Herodotus was right in declaring that he derived it direct from Sipsel. The fact that there is a common noun Sipselis hardly affects this assumption. It is true that the Sipselis is a bird, but the bird in question is shown by Aristotle's account of it to be either the house martin or some similar species that derives its name from its clay-built nest. The Sipselis is in fact the potter bird, but are we right in our main assumption? There is, of course, an alternative possibility. The story of the infant Sipselis may have been attached to him solely to explain his unusual name. Shubring's instances of stories that he thinks to have arisen in this way are neither convincing in themselves nor altogether analogous. But there is one fact that offers more solid grounds for not accepting Sipselis as a name that the tyrant derived from his occupation. An early king Sipselis of Arcadia is mentioned by Pausanias. This is a genuine difficulty, but there are several ways of meeting it. It is, for instance, quite conceivable that two different individuals should have independently earned the same nickname. The name need not have been used in the same sense on both occasions. The Sipselis is not only the potter bird. It may have been from this latter point of view that the name was thought appropriate for a king of the period of the Great Migrations. If this be thought unlikely, we might borrow a page from the skeptics and throw doubts upon the Arcadian's historical existence. We might explain him away as the eponymous hero of the Arcadian Sipsella. Or again, it might be pointed out that he is said to have been an ancestor of his Corinthian namesake's daughter-in-law. Melissa, the wife of Periander, the Arcadian Sipselis might then be disposed of as a creation of the pedigree mongers of the period when the marriage between Melissa and Periander took place. There is another name in the pedigree of the Corinthian tyrants from which historical conclusions have frequently been drawn. According to Aristotle, the third and last of the tyrants, 587,584 before Christ, was called Samatichus. A name which, as we have seen already, was born by the first pharaoh of the Sate 26th dynasty, which appears to have based its power largely on foreign mercenaries and foreign trade, both mainly Greek. 
The Egyptian name of the Corinthian tyrant has rightly been held to establish some sort of connection between the two states during the age of the tyrants. It has often been assumed that Samatichus of Corinth got his name directly from the Egyptian royal family. No certainty is to be had on this point. The name, though unknown before the time of Samatichus I, appears to have become common during the 26th dynasty. A Greek mercenary named Samatichus, son of Theocles, commanded the expedition, which has left us the graffiti of Abu Simbel. The name and position of the son of Theocles show that the Corinthian tyrant might have got his Egyptian name through a Greek intermediary. But, on the other hand, there is a fair probability that the governments of Corinth and Egypt at this period were in touch with one another either directly or through their common friend Miltus. But the really curious point about a Sipsilid being called Samatichus lies in the meaning of the name, which, as seen above, is most probably to be interpreted man vendor of mixing bowls. If this interpretation is correct, Samatichus and Sipsilis are synonyms. Now the modern historians generally follow Aristotle and give the name of the last tyrant of Corinth as Samatichus. But our other ancient authority, Nicolaus of Damascus, states that Periander was succeeded by a second Sipsilis, who came from Corsaira and became tyrant of Corinth until certain of the Corinthians combined and slew him and freed the city. Samatichus is called by Aristotle, the son of Gorgos. Sipsilis Roman II is described by Nicolaus as son of Periander's brother Gorgos. A Samatichus son of Gorgos is mentioned by Nicolaus as having been sent to Corsaira by Periander. The same author makes Sipsilis Roman II come from Corsaira to succeed Periander on the throne of Corinth. It is hard to avoid the conclusion reached by Busolt that Sipsilis Roman II and Samatichus are one and the same person. But need we follow Busolt further and assume that Samatichus changed his name to Sipsilis on his accession? Samatichus I of Egypt in his early days when he was a vassal of Assyria appears to have received from his overlord the Assyrian name of Nebuchadnezzar. Possibly, therefore, the Egyptian king might take it as a compliment if a Greek adopted an Egyptian name. But even this is doubtful. The saints would not be extremely anxious to follow the practices of Assyria and Babylon. The Greeks did not readily change their names. On the other hand, the Greeks loved to find equivalents between Greek names and Egyptian, as we see most markedly in their treatment of Greek and Egyptian gods. And heroes and likewise of Egyptian place names. According to the familiar Greek custom, and that Sipsilis and Samatichus were employed consciously as the Greek and Egyptian forms of one and the same name, both alike meaning man of pots. It may of course have been an accident that of the three names borne by the three tyrants of the Greek potteries two should be derived from words denoting some species of pot, but if so it is a very curious one.